Hello again, everyone. Let's see if we can culminate the Innumerable Meanings Sutra today. Uh, a little bit, if I have time, a little recap so we can be fully prepared to dive in to the actual chapters of the Lotus Sutra. Sancho Daimoku. Na Myo ho renge kyo na Myo ho renge kyo na Myo ho renge kyo na Thank you so much for following along. Um, Let's dive right into it. Good sons, this is the Buddha talking. The third inconceivable power of blessings of this sutra is this. If living beings can hear this sutra even once, even only one verse or phrase, they will master a hundred thousand myriad meanings. Even though they still have afflictions, it will be as if they do not. Even though they move through birth and death, they will not know fear. They will have compassion and sympathy for all living, all the living. They will be brave in following all the teachings. That's a meaty paragraph. <laughs> I'm already stopping to talk. All right. First of all, what is this innumerable meanings? What is he talking about when he says, uh, they will achieve, uh, what is he saying? 100,000 myriad meanings. Uh, even though they still have afflictions, they will, it will be as if they do not. Even though they move through birth and death, they will know not fear. Those two statements are really, really key to understand as we prepare to move into the Lotus Sutra teachings. Here's why. What he's saying when he says this is the teaching of innumerable meanings is not that the teaching itself is so convoluted and so um, non-specific that it has billions and billions of meanings which would suggest that it's just unknowable, which, in fact, he has said those kinds of sayings. But be careful to understand when, again, these are conversations about mental activity, about the mind. Uh, and you may have heard this a, a, a thousand times. I heard it as a kid, um, an old, uh, I don't remember what the experiment was about, uh, had to do with uh how we experience things, human experience. Um, but the point is this. You get uh, 10 people walk through a park by a fountain, okay? And then on the other side of the park, behind some trees, you sit down with them and you ask them one by one, do you remember a fountain? Some of them won't even remember the fountain. And then of the ones who remember the fountain, you ask them to describe the fountain. And some will say it had one level, some will say it had two, some will say it had three, some will say it just sprouted and spit water out of the top and then it overflowed on the rest. Some will say, oh, no, there were jets on the bottom as well. Uh, if two people out of that set of ten people absolutely agree, that would be surprising. So, in a way, you could also say, that the same fountain in the same park at the same time of day, all 10 people walked past it, each of them got a different meaning from that walk, from the fountain. Some of them got nothing. Some of them got all sorts of very different interpretations of the fountain. What's key to understand here isn't that the fountain has 10 different forms. It isn't that different people, some are stupider than others and don't see 
clearly only the one who could describe it accurately was the one with the smarts. No, it's not about that. It's that each of us, human or sentient beings, perceives the world and our experience more accurately of the world through our own karmic filters. What's going on in our head? Maybe we're having a tough time in a relationship and the fountain could care less. I'm just trying to get through this part and walk through this exercise. Other people have just discovered incense, perfumes, and, and uh, uh, yoga. And they walk through listening to the birds and the trees. And you know what? They might miss the fountain too. Or they may just see it as a wonderful display of water and it, describe it in that way. Everyone is going to have radically or minimally different experiences, just like life. So when the Buddha talks about these hundred myriad sands of the Ganges, all of those kinds of analogies, what he's pointing out is to his students, please try to understand, student, that your point of view is simply that. It's only your point of view. And that this is why it's important to rub up against other, not physically, although no, nothing wrong with that, but um, to interact with other people as you study Buddhism, simply because you will expose yourself to myriad, as the sands of the Ganges, experiences. Not that the meanings in themselves are all accurate. They're accurate for those minds. But in combining their cumulative experience, everybody gains greater depth of knowledge, greater perspective. Their worldview starts to expand. And as it expands, they begin to experience with a greater expansive mind. Remember, we're moving from a very narrow, self-oriented existence to an extremely broad, all-encompassing experience of life. That's the Buddha mind. So there's going to be these little sparks, these little awakenings constantly. That's why when I get questions like, how much should I chant? How many times should I repeat the Daimoku? How many, how much, uh, how much, uh, how many sutras should I read? How much time per day? First of all, everybody's different. Secondly, why would you shy away or minimize the great, my nose is bothering me. I apologize. Uh, allergies. Um, why would you minimize your opportunity to communicate, commune directly, invoking your Buddha mind to keep expanding and clear out the cobwebs that are narrowing your life experience? Right? I'd say chant constantly. <laughs> study constantly. In fact, Shakyamuni kind of said that. In fact, he said, study so much, don't just study all of the Buddhist commentaries, scriptures, everything else, but study the non-Buddhist stuff as well. Because ultimately, that's Buddhism too. Not their belief systems, but their perspectives. The way they see things will feed into your Buddhist filters more ways of understanding meaning. The meaning being the clarified filters to allow us to directly experience our Buddha mind. Everything else is, is like like a house of mirrors, if you've ever walked through one of those. They're, they're all distractions and diversions from reality. Reality, which is not samsaric reality like this computer. This is a temporary reality. 
which questions reality itself, right? It's temp, everything's temporary. So what's the overarching truth? What's the overarching reality? It's just energy. Can we experience everything in its proper perspective? Not negate it. Experience it fully, but understand what you're experiencing. Okay? Don't attach yourself to it, because ultimately, you're attaching yourself to vapor. (laughs) Ultimately, it just won't be there, nor will you. Okay? So, when he says myriad meanings, that's what he's talking about. There are many, many facets And those facets are all points of view. And then when he says, even though they move through birth and death, they will not know fear. When you read those kind of statements, you need to revise earlier misconceptions of when he talks about birth and death. How can you move through birth and death and not know fear? That's a statement that explicitly, well, implicitly, but just darn close to explicitly says, this is something you're experiencing right now in this moment. This isn't when you grow old and die and then the worms eat you and they poop out a new you whenever they feel like it. This, that's reincarnation. That's something the Hindus with all their mysticism are really confused about and, you know, uncles or cows and all. That's really, it's ridiculous thinking, okay? Um, there is no reincarnation in Buddhism. Birth and death are at the fundamental crux of what's going on here. You've heard it said in medicine that every seven years, every single cell from every hair, eyelash, and and color pigment in your eyeball to your toes, your lungs, your heart, your kidneys, every part of you, every single cell that makes up a you has has gone through getting rid of it, like when you exfoliate old skin, it's gone, it's trashed, it's dead, it it, it no longer is a living cell and has been replaced by new cells of the same um, type, all from stem cells from your marrow. This is all very biological, scientific, Um, so that in truth, every seven years, you are no longer the you that you were before. You are now a compendium of completely new parts. Imagine if you took your car and uh, uh, Every day of the week, you took uh, a chunk of the bumper off or the grill out and you replaced it with a new, you know, original equipment from the factory. But it'd be a new grill, a new hood, a new radio, a new upholstery, a new whatever. And then by the end of seven years, you would have replaced every single part of that car. Well, now that car is no longer the car that you initially purchased, is it? It's a completely new car, completely different. Some of the parts are a few years old, but still they're not the original ones, right? This is biology. This is science. What Buddha is saying is that we do this in every single moment of life. Every single moment of experience, the 3,000 realms in a single thought moment, each and in sense, and that's what that's about. So our perception of a past and our perception of a future is just, it's just inertia. From moment to moment, we bring from one moment whatever we've experienced in that moment, into the next moment. You see, there's already change. No matter how small a moment is, no matter how you want to measure it, there's a transference. And so there's this perception in this moment that there was a last moment, 
and there was, and in that moment, things were different, as they were. And logically, since we're moving linearly through these moments, we expect fully there will be another. Why do we expect that? Because we're attached. We're attached to this moment continuing, being permanent. Buddha's saying it isn't. It's impermanent. This is where your suffering begins. Your attachment to this continuing is what creates the inertia for the next moment to exist. But no matter how attached you are and how much you desire it to be permanent, it still decays. Eventually, there just won't be the energy to make it continue. It will fall apart. It will decay. It will dissipate. It won't go anywhere. It simply dissipates the same way it came into being. You participated in your birth. It wasn't just your mother or father. It wasn't just the egg and this and the sperm. It was your energy joining both of those. Now there's a triple combination that makes your experience. Boy, my nose is really going nuts. I'm really sorry. Anyway, does that does that make sense? So each one of those moments is an arising changing and decaying thing each one of those moments is a birth an experience and a death this is the cycle moment to moment to be in your buddha mind is to back off and observe this cycle and go oh i understand that's a very simplistic way of saying it but I think it helps you to understand this is the cycle of birth and death. You're going through it as I am in this very moment. And to escape from it isn't just to die. To escape from it is to be able to observe it objectively, use it constructively, and appreciate it for what it is. This glorious, precious moments in the life process. Use it to be happy. Use it to discover that there's no need to suffer. It's just the process. Don't be anxious about it. Don't be afraid of it. Don't glom onto it. Just watch it. Be with it. Revel in it. Swim in it. If you swim in a pool, you have a great time. If you start thinking about water is for drowning or drinking, you're not going to have much of a fun time in the pool. Right? Whew, that was a lot of stuff. Now let's see if I can't get through past one more paragraph, okay? <laughs> okay, so now with those things in mind, just as a powerful man can easily shoulder the whole and hold heavy things, the same is true of anyone who embraces this sutra, who embraces the meaning, the, the ideas that I'm giving you. Suddenly everything's easy, right? Like swimming in the pool. They can bear well the heavy treasure of unexcelled awakening and carry the living out of the way of birth and death on their backs. Even though they cannot yet save themselves, they will be able to save others. Just as the captain of a ferry who has to rest on this shore due to serious illness and inability to control his four limbs can cross over with a good solid ship that has everything needed to cross over the other shore to the other shore, one who embraces this sutra, though staying on this shore of ignorance, old age, and death, Due to the hundred and eight kinds of serious bodily illnesses with which he is afflicted in the five states of existence, can be saved from birth and death through practicing this powerful great vehicle sutra of innumerable meanings as it is taught, saving living beings. Good sons, this is called the third amazing power of blessings of this sutra. So do you understand what that means? By the way, I highlighted the 108 kinds of bodily illnesses. 
you'll notice that in the beads, in the beads that we use when we chant, there are 108 beads between the two Buddha beads. And additionally, there are four Bodhisattva beads in there, but the 108 are about this. They're about the afflictions or illnesses or whatever you want to call them. They're the basic groups of, of attachments, skandhas, the things that keep us attached to this moment to moment. I want it to be permanent life. So he's saying, if you now pay attention, he says embraces this sutra. You don't just read it and go, okay, I'm enlightened. <laughs> okay. You read it, you digest it as we are now, and you comprehend it in one of the myriad meanings that is your own. You can apply this knowledge to your life. And because now you have awakened to this new perception of what life is, you can carry your burdens, your sufferings, your, your malaise, with much greater ease because you understand that it's ephemeral that it's in your mind that it's not some it's not a dragon that's going to eat you make sense good sons the fourth oh my, we're not done the fourth inconceivable power of blessings of this sutra is this if living beings can hear this remember can can hear this sutra even once, even only one verse or phrase. Myoho Renge Kyo. Phrase. They will become brave, and even though they cannot yet save themselves, they will save others. Together with bodhisattvas, they will become part of the entourage of the Buddha Tathagatas, who will always preach the Dharma to them. Hearing it, they will receive and embrace the Dharma in accord with their capacities and never oppose it. Moreover, they will teach it for people everywhere as occasion demands. Good sons, suppose a king and his wife have a new prince. After a day or two days or seven days or a month, two months or seven months, or after he becomes a year old or two or seven years old, even though he would not yet ma manage national affairs, he would come to be revered by people and become a companion of the, of the sons of great kings, which with total affection, the king and his wife will always want to stay and talk with him. Why is this? It is because he is small and innocent. Good sons, one who embraces this sutra is also like this. The Buddha is the king. This sutra is his wife. Their coming together results in the birth of their child. A bodhisattva. I'm just checking the time. Sorry. If a bodhisattva can hear this sutra, even one phrase or verse, once, twice, ten times, a hundred times, a thousand or ten thousand times, a million or ten million times, or an unquantifiable, innumerable number of times, like the number of sands in the Ganges, Though not yet able to realize ultimate truth or shake the three thousand grateful thousandfold world or turn the great Dharma wheel with the thunderous Buddha voice, this Bodhisattva will be admired by all the four groups and the eight guardians of Buddhism and great Bodhisattvas will be in his entourage. Entering deeply into the secret Dharma of the Buddhas, he will explain it without errors or mistakes. He will always be protected by the Buddhas and especially showered with affection because he is a beginner in learning. Good sons, this is called the fourth amazing power of blessings of this sutra. So contained in there, uh, I'm hoping you heard it as I did is exactly what I was saying earlier. Why would you limit chanting your mantra, the mantra, the mantra, the law, myoho renge kyo? Why would you limit yourself? 10,000, 10 million thousand. You're still in the process. You're a bodhisattva. The minute you start studying, and this is what I tell people all the time, say, how do I become a monk? What monastery do I go to? What a monastic... Monastic practice is ancient. It's no longer valid. 
A monk is an interchangeable word with student. Make yourself a student, a good student. Study diligently. Read and embrace these sutras. The knowledge will come to you. You will get your aha moments. Oh, allergies are terrible annoyances. As my neighbor would say, you're a Buddhist. Just stop it. <laughs> He's so right. <laughs> good sons, the fifth inconceivable power of blessing of this sutra is this. If good sons or good daughters, either during the Buddha's lifetime or after his extinction, we're after, uh, receive and embrace, read, recite, and copy this profound and unexcelled great vehicle sutra of innumerable meanings, even though they still have attachments and afflictions and have not distanced themselves from affairs of ordinary men, they will reveal the way of great bodhisattvas. See, that, again, understand that he's saying you still have attachments. We still are in samsara. This whole practice of Buddhism is about realizing our Buddha mind while we're still, I don't want to say trapped, while we're still experiencing this samsaric condition, this instantiation of our energy. So our experience of, of being a human being, though it is a complexly veiled experience of ephemeral uh, reality, that does not encumber our ability to open our Buddha mind, even while we're in this state. This is the whole purpose of Buddhism. Remember? To, to resolve and put away, to escape, to liberate ourselves, from the sufferings of life and death. Life and death is all well and good. It exists. Don't deny it, because that just compounds your attachment to it. Just realize it, see it, appreciate it for what it is, and in the meantime, enlighten yourself. Awaken to the true, timeless reality of what all of this is dancing in. So, again, he's pointing it out constantly. Even though you're still in that world, the conditions of attachments and, uh, how do you say it here? And afflictions, afflictions being illusions, delusions. Um, and have not distanced themselves from affairs of ordinary men. What does he mean by distance themselves? Do you see the clues here? It's very important. When you distance yourself, what do you do? You become objective instead of subjective, right? The person caught in the rapid, rapids is subjected to the rapids. He hits rocks and gets carried away and pulled underwater. The person on the shore observing the person in the rapids can have great compassion for the person in the rapids, can empathize with their collision with the rocks and going under, and desperately wants to save them from their conditions. <laughs> That's a great analogy. I'll have to use that again. Samsara is like being in the rapids. The Buddha mind is like putting yourself on the shore. Remember he talks from one shore to another? Okay, let's continue. I'm having too much fun. <laughs> okay, extending a day to a hundred eons or shortening a hundred eons to a day, bringing joy to other living beings, they will convince them. Good sons. These good sons or good daughters are just like the son of a dragon who can make clouds appear and cause rain to fall seven days after he is born. Good sons, this is called the fifth amazing power of the blessings of this sutra. So now you're starting to understand the word blessings as little awakenings, right? 
They're not bestowed upon you from some other thing. They're self-realized mental attitudes it's about the mind good sons the sixth inconceivable power of blessings of this sutra is this if good sons or good daughters either during the buddha's lifetime or after his extinction receive and embrace read and recite this sutra even though they will still have afflictions they will teach the dharma to living beings separating them from afflictions of life and death and enabling them to cut off all suffering. I don't need to repeat myself here, do I? After, oh, excuse me. After hearing it, living beings will be put into practice and bec become no different from the Buddha Tathagata with respect to the blessings of the Dharma, the blessings of the fruit, and the blessings of the way. Suppose a king, due to travel or being ill, leaves the management of the affairs of the country to a prince. Though the prince is only a child, then the prince, by order of the great king, will lead all the government officials according to the Dharma and propagate good policies so that every citizen of the country follows his orders exactly as if the king himself were governing. It is the same with good sons or good daughters embracing this sutra during the Buddha's lifetime or after his extinction, even though they themselves cannot yet live in the first stage of immobility, these good sons will teach and promulgate the Dharma as the Buddha did. And if living beings, hearing them, practice it wholeheartedly, they will cut off afflictions and attain the blessings of the Dharma, the blessings of the fruit, and the blessings of the way. Good sons, this is called the sixth amazing power of the blessing of this sutra. So, in telling others, this is the Bodhisattva way now, in telling others what you've read and what you recite and teaching them about them, you are actually functioning as a Buddha. What he's saying is you're doing what I'm doing. And nothing leads you more quickly to full enlightenment than this. Good sons, the seventh inconceivable power of blessings of this sutra is this. If good sons or good daughters are able to hear this sutra either during the Buddha's lifetime or after his extinction and rejoice, have faith, and gain, I hate that word faith, but, and gain an unprecedented consciousness. If they receive and embrace, read, recite, copy, and explain this sutra, and practice it as it teaches, if they aspire to become awakened, if they cause all good roots to sprout, show great compassion, and want to relieve all living beings of suffering, though they will not yet be able to follow the six transcendental practices, these practices will come naturally to them, and they will attain acceptance of the non-arising of all things, life and death as afflictions, will be instantly destroyed for them, and they will rise to the seventh level of bodhisattvas. So at this point of realization, because you're teaching this correctly, you will definitely get to the point where you can stand on the side of the shore rather than being in the rapids. Follow? Suppose a vigorous man tries to destroy an enemy for his king. And after the enemy has been destroyed with great joy, the king gives him half the kingdom as a prize. Good sons or good daughters who embrace this sutra are like this. They are the most vigorous of all who practice the Dharma. They attain the Dharma treasure of the six practices, even though they are not consciously seeking it. The enemy of death and life will be destroyed naturally, and with the prize of an estate, they will be made comfortable, realizing that the treasure of half a Buddha land is the assurance of no birth. Good sons, this is called the seventh amazing power of blessings of this sutra. So when you get removed from the rapids, 
you suddenly realize that the rapids are actually simply a construct as well. And that you didn't need to be in it in the first place. But you can still appreciate it for what it is. Good sons, the eighth inconceivable power of blessings of this sutra is this. If good sons or good daughters, either during the Buddha's lifetime or after his extinction, find anyone who has received this sutra, they will make them revere, they will make them revere and believe it exactly as if they saw the body of the Buddha. Cherish and enjoy it, receive and embrace, read and recite, copy and honor this sutra. Follow and practice it according to the Dharma, firmly observing morality and endurance. At the same time, they will practice generosity and be deeply compassionate. And they will everywhere teach this unexcelled great vehicle sutra of innumerable meanings for the sake of people. If anyone for a long time does not at all recognize sin or blessedness, they will be shown this sutra, and with all sorts of skillful means, be firmly led to have faith in it. And again, faith is about a strong mind of conviction, not some expectation of delivery of whatever. Let's be clear. Through the power of this sutra, or more accurately, your studying and your commitment to the, the, the sutra, their commitment will be aroused and they will convert suddenly. After having their convictions aroused, they will bravely persevere, acquiring the virtues and powers of this sutra and attaining the way and its fruit. In this way, through the blessing of having undergone transformation, these good sons of our good daughters in their male and female bodies, will attain acceptance of the non-arising of all things, reach the upper stage, and with bodhisattvas as their attendants, lead living beings quickly to fulfillment, purify Buddha lands, and soon attain unexcelled awakening. Good sons, this is called the eighth amazing power of blessings of this sutra. Good sons, the ninth inconceivable power of blessings of this sutra is this, if good sons or good daughters receiving this sutra during the Buddha's lifetime or after his extinction, dance for joy, attain the unprecedented, receive and embrace, read and recite, copy and make offerings to this sutra, and everywhere explain its meaning through analysis for the sake of living beings. They will be instantly, they will instantly destroy the heavy hindrances of sins resulting from actions in the past and become purified. Oh my goodness, is that not something I want? Or any of us, I assume, we've all made mistakes in life, right? We've committed gross errors of negligence just from ignorance, just not knowing any better, right? And so it's really nice of Shakyamuni to say, if you really, if you really get gung ho about what this teaches, really absorb it, really make it part of your life, then your previous transgressions are meaningless. They'll just go away, right? Because that's part of letting go of that moment to moment attachment. If you're no longer attached to it, then all of that is meaningless, isn't it? <laughs> it's pretty smart. Okay. Instantly destroyed. They will acquire great eloquence gradually take on the marks of transcendental practices, attain various concentrations, including very courageous concentrations, enter the great gateway of incantations, and rise to the upper stage quickly through the power of diligent perseverance. There it is. That's, that's faith in a, the Asian mind. That's faith in Buddhism. It's diligent perseverance. But diligent perseverance isn't something you just wake up and go, I'm going to be diligent and perseverant today. Diligent perseverance is built on convictions, and convictions are built on experiences that prove out, that, that, that nurture themselves, really. So this is the process of practice of Buddhism. 
the more we study, the more we get these ahas, the more we witness in our own life experience the truths that are in here. They become part of our mental experience, don't they? They no longer are some foreign thing that we read. They become basically diagrammatic known experiences. And with those known experiences, we can release all the previous hogwash that we've hoarded, <laughs> right? They will, they will be embodied everywhere in all the lands of the ten directions and will save and free all the living beings who suffer greatly in the 25 states of existence. Such power can be seen in this sutra. Good sons, this is called the ninth amazing power of the blessings of this sutra. So when he's talking about lands and everything, I use the term world views. Because obviously the way you experience your life is in essence how you see the world. Your world. Your world is individual to your experience of it. Right? So these are Buddha lands. Or lands. They become Buddha lands as you awaken more and more to the reality of what they truly are. Unborn. Un... What's the word that he used? Anyway. Good sons. Finally, the last one. I hope I can get it in here. Good sons, the tenth inconceivable power of blessings of this sutra is this. If good sons or good daughters repeat receiving this sutra, either during the Buddha's lifetime or after his extension, greatly rejoice from experiencing such an unprecedented thing. Receive and embrace, read and recite, copy and make offerings to this sutra on their own accord. Practice as it teaches and also lead many monks and lay people to receive and embrace, read and recite, copy and make offerings to this sutra, explain it and practice it in accord with the Dharma, because of their powers of leading others to the practice of this sutra, and to attaining the way and its fruit, done through the power of working good-heartedly to transform others, all these good sons or good daughters in their bodies, will be able to pursue innumerable teachings without uh, about incantation. As common people, from the beginning, they will naturally make innumerable, countless, great vows and oaths, and deeply aspire to fulfill them in order to save all beings. They will re realize great compassion, thoroughly re relieve the suffering of the living beings, gather many good roots, and abundantly benefit all. They will extend the abundance of the Dharma and give water to the withered and dehydrated. They will generously give living beings the medicine of the Dharma, setting them all at ease, gradually elevating their views to live at the stage of the Dharma cloud. They will spread benevolence widely. What just happened? They'll spread benevolence widely, always being kind and leading the living who suffer into the track of the way. These people will be able to attain supreme awakening for long, before long. Good sons, this is called the tenth power of the blessings of this sutra. I think, I'm not going to end the innumerable meetings, but I think on that note, because things are happening here that I don't understand, we're going to close this lesson. Thank you for listening. I hope you got a lot out of that. I did. And the next video, We'll culminate the innumerable meanings and we'll move into the lotus. Okay? Thank you so very much for your support and your attention. Nam Myo Renge Kyo Nam Myo Renge Kyo Nam Myo Renge Kyo for those of you on Patreon, thank you again for any support you can offer me to keep making these videos. Have a wonderful day.